Well, we are continuing on with our series called The Mission of Jesus. And today, as Easter Sunday, we have a particular focus. And don't you just love this display in the middle? Isn't this fantastic? I just love that, that the cross can be front and center and so well lit. Fantastic. Great job. Looks so good. So being excited. How many of you are like the people who like to visually get excited with your, with your motions and your gestures and your words? How many of you are the, are the really excited outward people? I see all three of you. Hallelujah. <laughs> I am not alone. Okay, good. How about people who are excited in more quiet and subtle ways? We'll get you. <laughs> we'll get you yet. Being excited is fun. There's something that animates us when there's something, whether it's a, a circumstance or, or, or God has come through in some way, where being excited gives us energy. And, and as I was thinking about being excited about Resurrection Sunday and Easter and, and, and being with all of you this morning, I thought, there are so many different levels of being excited. So I want to walk with you guys through different levels that I, these are not clinical, this is not a psychologist's point of view, this is just my observation. Different levels of being excited. So level one of being excited would be, that's cool. So what would that look like? When you get an extra slice of bacon on your takeout burger, that's cool, right? You take a bite, you open it up like, oh, that's two slices instead of one. Today is uh, my lucky day, that's cool. What about level two? Nice. You ever hear somebody say that? Nice. That's a big one in our house. What would that look like? When you find a $20 bill in that jacket you haven't worn in forever. Anybody have that? I have never had that. <laughs> if I've got a toonie, I know exactly where it is. It's on the dresser. It's in the little change thing in the truck. Man, I, I'd never find money like that, but that's okay. What would level three look like? Sweet. Anybody ever use that one? Sweet. That is sweet. What would that look like? When you get offered a hotel upgrade for no extra charge. That's sweet. Whether you're on a, on a vacation or, or, or taking your kids to hockey or something, like, hey, we've got something available. Would you? Yes, I would. That would, be, that would be sweet. Thank you. But it gets even better. Awesome. If you're from the 80s, that was probably the most overused word in the 80s, besides rad. Any ideas what awesome would look like? When you win the local raffle for something cool, right? you get a ticket and you're like, ah, oh, somebody's got to win, maybe it'll be me, probably not. And then you get the phone call. When, uh, when we were in, in Stettler in the, in the early days, we were just making plans to, to build our house. Denise's parents were down for a visit, and uh, it was... I think it was early spring, just about, I think it might have actually been Easter time. And, and they came for a visit, and the local Canadian Tire had just opened. And so Denise and her mom had, you know, kind of gone to see, you know, like, this new store in town. It's kind of like everybody's all abuzz. We've got a Canadian Tire. It's fantastic. So they go, and then they've got this little draw box, and it's like a $1,000 uh, gift card for in-store. And so I come home from the church after, after a, a long day, and there is Denise and her parents almost standing in the doorway like this. And I'm like, should I be suspicious? <laughs> What's happening right now? And they said, you got a phone message. There's a, there's a phone message for you. You should answer your phone message. <laughs> so, I, so I grab the phone and I tap into our voicemail. And, and it's like, you know, hello, this is so-and-so, the manager of the new Canadian Tire. And you won our $1,000 shopping spree. So I'm like, dang, that is awesome. <laughs> So we got, like, we got like sleds and bikes, and I got some new tools to help with, with building the house. It was like, that was just like the perfect thing at the perfect time. It was awesome. But it gets better. <laughs> Level five, amazing. What would amazing look like? <laughs> oh, hey, you're close. You're close. Making the Olympic hockey team. That would be amazing. You know, that's kind of like a one, in a one in a 20 million chance to make the Canadian Olympic hockey team. And how many kids grow up, you know, dreaming of being in the NHL or being on the Olympic team. It would be amazing 
to be that one person in, in a 10 million who makes the Canadian Olympic hockey team. But it gets better. Level six, unbelievable. What could be better than making the Canadian Olympic hockey team? Oh, there's Pete, at least. There's something even better. You win a gold medal on that Olympic hockey team. That would be unbelievable to be that team and on that team that wins the gold on that particular Olympic year. Oh, but there's one better. One better. What could it be? Level seven. Mind blowing. What would that look like? You score the overtime winning goal for that gold medal in the Olympics. The pinnacle of pinnacles. That would be mind blowing. You see how different layers of being excited depending on what's happening. And that is an outside reality. Like in springtime, people's moods tend to improve and, and you, know, you get to go for walks, you get to be outside more and people are checking the temperature to see if it's time to wear shorts and if you're me, that's 365. Doesn't matter how cold it is. But that's also an internal reality as well. There are things to be excited about. And you, you've probably heard me say it before, but as, as a culture, I don't know that we celebrate super well. It's kind of like, it's going to go away, so don't get too excited. Right? Don't get your hopes up too high, just in case you get let down. Anybody feel that way sometimes? You kind of just don't really want to get to that level seven excited, because what happens when it changes? Can I just give you permission to do that? We're not always going to experience a level seven excitement. But when you do, you should celebrate. Because even when it does change, we can still hold on to those moments. I think the disciples experienced a lot of that on Resurrection Sunday. On Good Friday, we talked about the disappointment the disciples must have felt as the person that they thought was going to be crowned a political king to restore Israel was put on trial, arrested, and crucified. Their level seven change to a level zero in an instant. But it doesn't mean you shouldn't experience a level seven or six or five or whatever. It just means when you're there, you know things can change, but it doesn't scare you. Because our hope isn't anchored in current realities. It's not anchored in our finances. It's not anchored in our government. It's not anchored in our ability to make the world a better place. It's anchored in a resurrected Savior. It's anchored in Jesus. So this resurrection equals life. That life equals salvation. What does that look like? John chapter 11, verse 25 to 26. Jesus said to her, this is uh, Mary and Martha the, the, uh, and Lazarus from Bethany. They were good friends with Jesus. Jesus said to her, this is after the death of Lazarus, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? I'm sure it must have been confusing. Because we don't just watch people rise from the dead. That's not a very common experience. Anybody ever seen that? If, if you have, we need to trade places. And I want to hear what you have to say. That's not a common thing. But here Jesus is explaining to her that faith is the key to unlocking eternal life. And eternal life is wrapped up in the person of Jesus. It's not wrapped up in any other method. It's not wrapped up in any other system, any other philosophy, any other religion, any other pathway. It's wrapped up in Jesus alone. He didn't say, I am one of the resurrections. I am one of the lives. He said, I am the resurrection. I am the life. And it's through this resurrection we can experience greater realities than just everyday living. We can see these different levels of what it means as we follow Jesus. It's not always easy, and sometimes we move down that ladder of excitement. 
Sometimes there are things that are incredibly difficult or painful. But that resurrection life allows us to stay anchored even when things change. Titus 3, 4 to 7. Paul says, when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he's talking about Jesus, he saved us not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy, because we needed it and could not do it ourselves. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. Is that exciting to you? That's exciting. Imagine being helpless and hopeless, having no power or authority to change your situation, completely dependent on the working of somebody else for your well-being. It's almost like a newborn baby. A newborn baby can't think for themselves. They can't dress themselves. They can't walk to the grocery store and grab some milk for, for lunch. Completely and utterly dependent on the outward help of parents and family. What Paul is saying is we were born helpless and hopeless born into the condition of being separated from God. But it's not because we had chose to be separate from God. We were born with that reality as our identity, which is why Paul says it was God's mercy towards us in sending Jesus. He acted mercifully towards those who could not help themselves and who also did not earn it. That's exciting. To help someone who is helpless, who does not deserve to be helped. That is the very definition of mercy. That is the very definition of the love of God, who would do things that no ordinary person would do. It's the thing that actually separates him from us. He can do this perfectly. We can imitate that mercy and that compassion, but we can't do it to the same degree that he can, otherwise we'd be able to save ourselves. And we can't. That's exciting news. Everything we needed was provided through Jesus. Everything we needed was provided through Jesus. What is this life, this resurrection life, this salvation? If you were to pull out a a classic evangelical theology book, which I know you all love to do on a Sunday afternoon, This would be the classical definition you would read, or something like this. That faith in Jesus Christ causes a person to be born again by the Holy Spirit, giving them eternal life. And that this faith saves a person from sin and death and their effects, which is hell, eternal separation from God. This faith reconciles a person to God and brings them into the fellowship of all believers throughout all time. That's, that's my best paraphrase of what you would read in a classic evangelical theology book. And all of those things are wonderful and true. Those things alone should be exciting. That God has provided forgiveness, that he has provided salvation, that he's opened up the door for us to experience not just life in this life, as in the life of purpose and meaning and connection with one another and with God, but also an eternal life when this life is done. It's kind of like the gift that keeps on giving. It's greater than the $20 bill you find in that jacket pocket, of far greater value. These truths are wonderful enough in themselves. But in a very real way, they only form the foundation of the different levels of greatness that are associated with this life, this resurrection life that Jesus gives. So I introduce to you one of the most amazing words in all of the Bible. This is not the English word, this is the the Greek word. It's pronounced sozo. And the word sozo means to save, 
to heal, to make whole, to deliver, to protect. That sounds like a pretty good word. If you're a parent out there, you're like, oh yeah, yeah. That's, that's me with my kids. I want, I, want to, I want to save them. I want to heal them. I want to make them whole. I want to protect them. I want to, I want to raise them in a way where they, where they know the Lord, where they experience purpose and meaning. That's how our heavenly daddy feels towards us. This is his desire for each one of us. I'm going to share a secret with you. Not many people would tell you this because it's not easy and it's not and it's not popular. If your way of living and believing revolves more around what is forbidden than what is permitted, you are a legalist and a Pharisee. If your Christian life revolves more around what I am forbidden to do, what I shouldn't do, what I'm not allowed to do, what other people think I shouldn't do. If your life revolves more around those things than around the goodness of God and what He has provided, then you're in great danger of being a legalist or a Pharisee. Because this word, this word sozo is the life that Jesus came to bring, that opens doors, that expresses mercy and forgiveness, that invites people into relationship with their Heavenly Father, who don't earn it, who cannot make that way themselves. And that's you and that's me and that's anybody else who is wavered, who does not yet know the wonderful kindness of Jesus. The way is made. The way is provided through His resurrection. The invitation is given to all regardless of where we come from, what our family dynamic is, how much dysfunction or addiction or brokenness we carry, that is the life that is in Jesus Christ. That life brings meaning and purpose. That life is meant to save, to heal, to make whole, to deliver, to protect. Salvation alone is great. Eternal life alone is amazing. But it's mind-blowing to think that even beyond that, there are blessings from God through Christ that would help us to grow and have meaning today. We don't just hold on to our golden ticket and wait to get to the other side. You can, and you are loved, but there is so much more than just holding on for heaven. There is so much more than just walking through an ordinary life, hoping for something just a little bit better than yesterday. You can live that way. And God is with you. And He loves you. And He will protect you. And heal you. And deliver you. And teach you and guide you. Because He is faithful. And He expresses mercy even when we don't deserve it. But there is so much more to this life for us to experience today. Here's a few scriptural examples that cover the different meanings of that word. Matthew 1, 21. The angel talking to Mary about her giving birth to Jesus. She will give birth to a son. Actually, the angel talking to Joseph. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. This is that classic evangelical, Jesus came to die for our sins. Yes and amen. He will rescue his people from their sin. We are rescued from sin through Jesus. Meaning when we stumble and fall and when we sin, he's already paid for it. The only thing left for us is to restore relationship with God. 1 John 1, 1.9. If you've ever been to Sunday school, this is probably one of the first verses you ever memorized. That he is faithful and just to forgive us all of our sin, to cleanse us from all, from all unrighteousness if we confess our sin. He's made the provision. And yet how many of us, when, when we do something we know we shouldn't do, we lose our temper, we give in to that temptation, we, we spend our money frivolously, we say a careless word to somebody we love and care about, and we go, oh man, I, just, I know I shouldn't do that, but I just can't help it. Sometimes I get angry, and sometimes I just get frustrated, and then we feel, we feel ashamed, we feel embarrassed, and we're like, how do I make this right? Jesus already made it right. Our responsibility is then to confess to God 
and to restore that relationship. I messed up, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? Easy words to say, but yet so hard at the same time. He will save his people from their sins. So wonderful. Matthew 9, 22, we're going to return to this one a little bit later in a slightly different way. This is the story of the woman who had bleeding for 12 years. Like, I think you know what kind of bleeding I'm talking about, a, a woman's form of, of, of bleeding, and subject to it for 12 years. In that culture, you realize that what that meant, she could not participate in community life at all. She couldn't go to church, she couldn't go to the hockey rink, she couldn't go to family dinners, none of that stuff. She was always what they called unclean because of her bleeding. So she was always outside, outside the camp, outside the family, outside the community, ostracized, looked at as being dirty or because anybody who would touch her themselves would become unclean. So Jesus comes to her because she reaches through the crowd and says, if I can just touch the edge of his robe, I'll be healed. And so she breaks her way through the crowd, she touches the end of his robe, and she's immediately healed. No more bleeding. There's lots to say about that, but maybe another day. But he said, daughter, your faith has healed you. That's the same word. She was physically healed because of that faith. So now we have salvation, the free gift of God through Jesus Christ that rescues us from our sin, gives us eternal life, but we also have that same faith that unlocks eternal life also unlocks healing and forgiveness. What a powerful moment that would have been. Matthew 8, 25. The disciples went and woke him as they're in a boat and the waves are huge and they think they're going to drown. Can you imagine being a professional fisherman and you're scared of the water you're on? <laughs> that must have been some kind of storm for the disciples to be rattled that much. They rush to Jesus, they're like, save us, don't you care? We're going to drown here. Same word, save us, rescue us, take away this problem, protect us from this harm. Same word. Life in Jesus is more than just forgiveness and eternal life, as amazing as those things are. It is the real presence of God with us and in us in our daily lives, giving us whatever we need to walk closer with Him, to walk in victory over evil, to experience purpose and meaning, and to follow His will for our lives. Imperfectly, as imperfect people. That's great news. That is fantastic news. So in the same way, there's different levels of being excited. I think there's different levels of the goodness of God to be experienced in this life that he brings through Jesus. Level one, rescued from darkness, sin, and death. 1 Peter 2.24 says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. There we have salvation and healing in the same verse. It's that same word, that same word that means life. Level two, not just rescued from sin in this life, but we have a home waiting for us on the other side. This hope of eternal life in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Not just forgiven so that we can kind of enjoy a slightly better life, but that life that begins when someone places their faith in Christ, that is the beginning of eternity for that person. That person, as Jesus said, even though they will physically die, they will live forever. So when someone is born again through faith in Christ, that is the moment of their spiritual birthday. And that life will never end. So our brother Dennis, his eternal life is now, has now reached its fullness. He is with Jesus, perfected in heaven. His eternal life began when he gave his life to Christ. 
And though he has passed away from this life, he has entered the next in the presence of Jesus. It's far better for him right now, even than it is for us. That's powerful. That means no matter what happens in this life, there is still something better to look forward to. That there is something beyond this life that can help pull us through when things are really, really rough. And for some people, this life can be really, really rough. For others, it seems to be really smooth. I don't have good answers for why that is, other than this world does not perfectly reflect God's will, His perfect will. So that hope of eternal life in Christ brings us through what is difficult in this life. And that's powerful. How do I know? Watch how people respond to death who don't know Jesus. It's totally different. Because that hope isn't there. That thing that can pull you through the most difficult circumstance is absent. And all a person has left is their own understanding, their own will, their own physical things. And none of those things can heal like Jesus can. But it gets even better. Level three, physical healing. James 5.15, the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. This is an incredibly sensitive topic. And that doesn't bother me at all. I don't have all the answers. But I do know it's better to ask for healing than to not. But I do know if there's going to be healing, it's going to come from Jesus. And not from Reiki. Not from crystals. Not from stars. Not from books. Not from hard work. Not from wisdom or intellect. Not from a university degree. None of those things. If there's healing to come, it comes from Jesus. And we're asked to ask. If you've asked for healing and it hasn't come, don't stop. A good parent knows when to say no and knows when to say not yet and knows when to say yes. That much I trust. Our Father knows what we need. But he gives us permission and freedom to ask. There's something about asking that actually helps us to grow. Not in the answer, but in the asking. But there is healing. Even in a Good Friday service. Maybe even on an Easter Sunday. Level four. If you're not the kind of person who likes to talk about emotions very much, men... This one's for you. It's for all of you. But this is for those who maybe are uncomfortable talking about matters of the soul. This word sozo, to make whole, body, soul, and spirit. Body means physical healing. Spirit means spiritual healing. That's forgiveness and eternal life. But this one in the middle, soul, I'm going to give you my best, my best analysis of how that works. Think about all of your memories, all of your emotions, all of your experiences. There's a place in our life where those things go. They register in our soul. Bad experiences never go away. Good experiences are never forgotten. But all of those things get deposited into that place we call the soul. Think of it as a great big well. And everything that we experience, everything we think, everything we feel, all of our dreams and hopes and failures and bad and good, all of those things get dumped into this well. What happens when you have a, a glass of water and you put one drop of red dye in it? The whole glass of water becomes red. 
What happens when we experience difficulties or trials or persecution or we make bad decisions or there's consequences for those? Those things get deposited into that place and what should be a place where there is pure and clean water because Jesus brings that cleansing. Those negative things, they take what should be a good place in our being and taints it. There's no other way to say it. You can't just shrug off a negative experience. That's why we have expressions like, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. Or, once bitten, twice shy. Those experiences, friends, don't go away. But they can be healed. They can be healed. I have seen people healed from trauma, from abuse, from difficult decisions, from lifetimes of addiction. I've seen people who have been brought by Jesus to a better place who thought it was totally impossible. It's because Jesus came to bring life. Not just forgiveness, not just eternal life, but so much more in this life for us to experience. Jesus called this woman daughter. Back to that passage of the woman who was bleeding. Take heart, your faith has healed you. He called her daughter. Can you imagine the last time she would have been called daughter? It would have been before she started her illness. Probably been more than 12 years since she had experienced the loving, gentle hand of her father or a friend or a family member. That word daughter wasn't just Jesus being nice. That was Jesus reaching into the place where she had experienced the deepest level of wounding. I'm just going to say this really plain, and I hope you really follow me. The place of greatest wounding in your life is also the greatest opportunity to experience the healing of Jesus. Many people walk away from a relationship, from church, from a community, because they're hurt. And we're human, we have responses. We don't like being hurt. But it will never go away. But it can be healed. And Jesus would bring healing into that place to restore us into community. He doesn't just save us so we can be with him forever. He saves us so we can be together as a body of believers who love one another deeply. Churches aren't always real good at this. Sometimes people are more focused on being right than being loving. We're human, it happens. But Jesus has given us this wonderful gift of sozo. This wonderful gift that brings and invites us back into community, even when there's hurt. And there's ways we can restore and repair relationship. But we have to be willing to embrace that life first. And that's not easy. Because I think we often get so comfortable with our hurt that it becomes part of our identity. I'm going to leave that with whoever needs to sit with that for a while. Just know that there's more. That he would bring healing body, soul, and spirit to anybody who needs it. Level five, a change in identity. This is fantastic. Romans 8, 15. The spirit you receive, this is the Holy Spirit who indwells those who place faith in Jesus Christ. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. Spiritual orphans adopted by a heavenly father through Jesus Christ. That's a powerful deal. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. This life that he brings changes our identity. It changes what we think about ourselves. It has the power to transform the very fabric of how we live. I have lots to say about that, but we don't have time this morning. Keep coming back. We'll get there. 
I promise. But this life that Jesus brings, it changes who we are. It doesn't just change our destiny and our trajectory, but it changes who we are. You may feel alone. You may feel ashamed. You may feel anxious. You may feel confused. You may feel worried. But friends, those are not your identity. Your identity is wrapped up in how much your Heavenly Father loves you. That He would restore relationship through Jesus. That He would send His Son to the cross to make the ultimate payment so that you and Him could have a deep and meaningful relationship. There is nothing more powerful than that. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. That changes the fabric of reality for who we believe we are. So we have a gap to deal with. You don't have to show hands. But how many of you, if I said, do you know that you've experienced this sozo life that Jesus brings? You might say, I know I'm forgiven, or I know I have eternal life, but some of the other stuff I don't know. I would guess that most of you would be in that category. Which means, what I'm telling you is true, and what we typically experience are not the same. There's a gap between what it seems like Scripture is telling us and what our everyday Christian experience is. I constantly feel that gap. The more I become aware of these things, the more I'm like, oh, good heavens, how do we do this? (laughs) I am a learner (laughs) in these things, but I'm happy to pass on anything that I have learned. There's only two ways to deal with that gap. Two ways, no more. You can bring what Scripture teaches down to your level. It must not be true. That must be the wrong interpretation of these verses. Because I haven't seen it. Because I haven't felt it. Because I haven't experienced it. So it must not be true. That's option one. That's a bad option. Just so we're clear. The other option is, what will it take to elevate my Christian experience, to match what Bible clearly teaches? You can throw it out, or you can pursue it with all your heart, but friends, there's nothing in between. You can't say, I want this, I want sozo on Friday, but the other six days I want to do my own thing. It doesn't work that way. If you want life, you want all of life. If you want what he has to give, you're embracing everything he has to give, regardless of how weird or confusing or dynamic or uncomfortable it might make you. But it's far better than what we can manufacture on our own, I promise you that. Those are the only two ways to deal with the gap. That gap is what we call faith. The certainty of what we do not see. The conviction that it's true, even if I haven't yet arrived, at that truth. That is the nature of faith. I know I'm a good fisherman. I don't always catch a lot of fish or big fish. But I know that if I I keep fishing, I'm going to get them. That's the nature of a faith that brings conviction. I thought about doing fishing as my levels of excitement, but I thought, well, I'm going to hit one-third of our audience, so (laughs) I picked something different. Hockey's Pretty universal. Philippians 2.12 is our instruction for this. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. If I were to paraphrase this in the most meaningful way, I would say there is more to the Christian life than what you currently experience And it's one uncomfortable step away to take your next step. There's always more. If you talk to a person like Billy Graham, I'm sure he would say something like, I wish I could live 20 more years. There's just so much more of God to experience, so much more things to do and to be a part of. Work out your salvation. Ask the question, why do I not experience what Scripture is teaching? What is getting in the way? You might be surprised what God tells you. And then it takes courage to address that thing 
that's standing in the way. So as we pray and close, I want to take a moment. I'll, I'll pray for a little bit. And I want each of you just to take a quiet moment to, to reflect, not, not, not to pray just yet, but just reflect for a moment on the status of what you feel like your current Christian experience is. Maybe even the things you would like to see but you haven't seen. Layers of growth or healing. Maybe, maybe some of these truths about what this life is give you hope where maybe you haven't had hope yet. Maybe that's a good thing to reflect on for a moment. It's kind of up to you where you feel like God wants you to reflect. So I'll pray for you. We'll give a moment of just quiet just for you to reflect. And then we're going to pray through a couple of Jesus questions as we pray and close. So join me as we pray. Jesus, I, I just feel like there's so much more to talk about. So much more to say. So much more uh, of your presence that we can experience. And, and even as I pray that out loud, I know that it's difficult for some uh, to imagine that you have called us into a deeper experience of you where faith in some ways has been relegated, we need to learn more information about you. But you didn't come to give us information. You came to bring transformation. Transformation of our character, our soul, our relationships, our lives, and our eternal destiny. You came to bring all of those things, and we didn't earn them. We don't deserve them. But you are kind. You invite us deeper into our faith. Even if we're uninterested, you invite us. Even if we're far away, your love is not diminished or altered in any way. You are not embarrassed or ashamed of us. You draw us close to you. So as we take a moment, Jesus, just to reflect in our own hearts, just pray that you would put on each one of our hearts where you want us to reflect. Do we really want more of this life you give us? Do we really have faith that you are who you say you are? That you love us that much? Wherever you want us to sit with you, Jesus, we just take a moment for you uh, to draw near to us. And Lord, because you want to lead us forward in our faith, regardless of where we are this morning, I just want you to answer two questions for us as we pray together. Lord, what is standing in the way of me experiencing your sozo, the life you have to bring? What's standing in the way? For some of you, it might be the fear of being hurt or burned again. For some, it might be the question, what do I have to sacrifice to move to this next level? For others, it might be the uncertainty that it could actually be true. For some, it might be a feeling of being unworthy of the life that you bring. For some, it might even be, I'm not actually even that interested. I like my life the way it is. And Lord, I pray that you would bring your, uh, your ministering presence to each one of us where we are. Would you do what only you can do that's lovingly call us forward? We know that we have decisions to make and you will never force us, but you're always inviting us. So give us courage, I pray, to say yes, to respond in faith, and Lord, in what area of my life do you want to bring your life? What part of our lives do you want to change with your life?
Thank you, Lord, that we can, with absolute certainty, know that it is your desire to draw close to us, wherever we are. That it is 100% your desire to meet us in the places where we are frustrated or hurt or upset or confused or even complacent or uninterested. You would meet us even in those places because it doesn't bother you. It doesn't scare you. It doesn't make you nervous. And it doesn't push you away. So we rest in that today, Jesus. That we don't have to have all the answers. But you simply ask for us to be willing to take one step forward. So would you release your courage and your strength over each one of us? Would you release anything that has to do with fear or shame or guilt or unworthiness? Uh, we just send those things away in Jesus' name. We just declare out loud that you are the one who makes us worthy. We want to say yes, Jesus. Even though we don't know exactly where it's going to take us. It's exciting. And it's an adventure. And you call us deeper into it. So we just want to say yes to whatever capacity we are able to this morning. You would meet us there. For your glory and in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.